so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end forever you and I will be in heaven or hell period In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen, Amen. Well I'm delighted to uh, be with you I have been with the Blue Army before more than once, but I think only on the East Coast, as I remember. The last time, I think, was in Connecticut. Uh, but it's always a delight, I think, very highly of the Blue Army and the great work that you've done. And I'm going to talk this weekend. I'm, going to, I'm doing a new series uh, with you this weekend. Um, we're recording it, filming it. Uh, and it's on Fatima today. Message of Life for a Dying World. And during the course of uh, six sermons, which I'll give to you, uh, as our announcer said this evening, I'm going to speak first about the angels, uh, messengers, and the message. Um, those of you who are familiar with Fatima know how important uh, the angels were in the um, revelations at Fatima, and of course, the angels are important in everyday life. They're part of the doctrine of the faith. Uh, second, the second talk this evening, I'll give on the rosary and the brown scapula. And you know how important that is with respect to Fatima and in general. Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about reality in the third sermon. Reality, kind of like the news channels do, reality check. <laughs> reality. Very important. You know what reality is, absolutely speaking? God. Uh, God said, I am who am. Absolute, pure reality is God. Do you know what a good working definition of insanity is? To be out of touch with reality. That goes a long way to explaining what's going on in the world, doesn't it? If you're out of touch with God, you're out of touch with reality. You're really insane. <laughs> really. And I mean it literally. Uh, and that describes what's going on. We, we have an insane situation in the world. It's crazy. So I'll talk about reality. God, the reality of sin, grace, heaven and hell. Basic stuff. Like I said from the beginning, when the uh, director of my doctoral thesis in Spain, when I finished it and was about to receive my doctorate, he said, you, you've now earned five university degrees, and uh, we don't have any more to give you, so I assume you're finished. <laughs> At what level will you teach? And he was expecting me to say, well, I'll teach in the seminary, uh, in the university, uh, but I didn't have to think about it at all. It, it, he said, at what level you, will you teach? And I said, kindergarten. <laughs> and I've been doing it ever since. Kindergarten. You know, most Catholics really never advance be, beyond the basics. And that's okay. If you get the basics, that's good enough. That, that's all you need is the basics. But you've got to get the basics. Ninety-eight percent of us haven't even gotten the basics. That's what's wrong with the church, and that's what's wrong with the world. And so we have to work on improving that. Penance. We'll talk uh, on, on the angel's message. Penance, penance, penance. Message of, for the world today. Message of the cross. Very important. I'll talk in the fifth sermon on the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, a very real thing, something that is coming, uh, and you won't have to wait many centuries for it, I don't believe. And then in the final talk, which basically is um, the continuation 
and conclusion of that talk on the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I'll talk about the Eucharist, life for a dying world. The Eucharist, the source, center, and summit of the Church's life. The Eucharist, the greatest gift a loving God ever gave to his beloved children. The Holy Eucharist is the, the great treasure entrusted to the Church. And I'll, I'll give you a little hint, a little preview. Tomorrow afternoon, when I do that last talk on the Holy Eucharist, I'm going to have something very serious to say to Catholics at large. And before it's over, millions will have heard the message. Uh, you're, you're, going to, uh, you're going to be here with me doing this series, and we're going to be making a serious statement. We've got an election year this year in the most powerful, influential nation on the face of the earth. Now, I'll tell you ahead of time, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. That's your business. You know, I, I can't tell you who to vote for. That's, that's none of my business. That's between you and God in the uh, voting booth, you know. And, and so I'm not going to say anything about that. You know, I'm not, not going to tell you to vote Republican or Democrat. I'm not going to say any of that. But what I am going to say, and I am going to say it in my own way, <laughs> in no uncertain terms, I'm going to tell I'm going to give you principles. I'm going to tell you things that will help you. You've got to form your conscience. And then you've got to vote your conscience. And you know, we're Catholics and we're Christians. That means we've got to have a Catholic and Christian conscience formed to the objective norm of truth. You have a serious moral obligation to form that conscience and then to vote that conscience. We are poised on the edge of cataclysmic times. We have reached a decisive juncture in history. We can make history for better or for worse. And so in that last talk tomorrow, I'm just giving you a little hint, a little preview. I'm going to have plenty to say to Catholics, whether they be average Catholics, politicians, or bishops. I'm going to have something to say. I'll have my say. And before it's over, millions of people will hear it. That's why I have a frightening responsibility. I'm afraid to shut my mouth. <laughs> okay. Let's launch out into the deep then with the angels. The angels. We know that at Fatima, uh, the angels were a very important part of uh, the messages at Fatima, the way that God and Our Lady uh, spoke to the children. Uh, the, word the word angel means messenger. You know that. Um, very interesting uh, that the word angel doesn't describe what they are. Uh, it describes what they do. What they are is pure spiritual essences, right? Non-bodily beings. They have an intellect and a will. They're creatures. Now, but, by the way, now I know I don't have to tell you this. Um, you and I are friends. Uh, I, I don't have to say a whole lot to you folks. This is a rather easy audience for me to speak to because I know that I know where most of you are coming from, if not all of you. Uh, I know that you believe in the existence and activity of the holy angels, but there are people who don't. Now, that doesn't bother me, but there are some Catholics who don't. Uh, I, I remember one of the, f I think it was the first uh, to a large, I told this story a million times, but I'll tell it one more time. They didn't know who I was. They didn't know what they were getting, but they had heard that I was available and somebody got sick, so I filled in. 
And the keynote speaker gave a talk, and I heard it. I was right there. He was a rather well-known theologian and uh, of the liberal variety. <laughs> and he said, uh, it went kind of like this. Well, uh, you know, we don't really believe in angels anymore. That's how he started his talk. Uh, we don't really believe in the actual existence of angels. No, you see, angels are what we call a literary device. Something that's used in sacred scripture to illustrate a point, to make some theological point. And at that point, by the way, there was an elderly woman in the front row, as there always is, somewhere or other. <laughs> And they are my best friends, I want to tell you. Uh, and, uh, you know, when he said, we don't really believe in angels anymore, uh, they're just literary devices, the old gal turned to her friend and whispered, I wish one of them there literary devices would come down and kick his butt. <laughs> well, <clears throat> he went on. And we don't really believe in purgatory because God could never allow suffering of any kind. And we certainly don't believe in hell because a good and loving God could never have a hell. Well, finally he finished. And wouldn't you know it, he went and sat right next to the old girl. <laughs> now, she had reached that age where she really didn't care. You know? Now, I, I watched this all unfold. <laughs> she tried. She really tried to be on her best behavior. She, you could tell she was struggling with it. But finally, she leaned over and whispered in his ear, Father, you don't believe in hell. And he said, oh, no, my dear. He said, well, you'll believe it when you get there. <laughs> And that rather illustrates the point. <laughs> Listen, the existence and activity of the holy angels is a part of the doctrine of the faith. That's not optional teaching. That's not medieval theology. That's not an old wives' tale. That's rock-solid doctrine. There are angels, and they are active in the work of salvation. Let me read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a section on the angels in the profession of faith, in the first section. Paragraph 328. The existence of the spiritual, non-corporeal beings that sacred scripture usually calls angels is a truth of faith. The witness of scripture is as clear as the unanimity of tradition. So, I know that I don't have to convince you, but let's start there. It's an absolute doctrine of the faith. You have to believe that. Anyone who professes to be Catholic or Christian who doesn't believe that doesn't believe what the church believes. No question about it. There are angels. All right. What do they do? Well, they're messengers. That's what the word means, messengers. They carry messages from God to us. They convey things to us. Uh, and likewise, they bring things from us to God. You remember the image of Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament, of the angels ascending and descending as if on a ladder. Uh, they're... they're uh, they are the original information superhighway. The angels. Uh, they do other things, too. Uh, they protect us. They're our guardian angels. Um, every human being... Now, this is also part of the doctrine of the faith. Every human being has a guardian angel assigned to him by God from the very beginning. Now, never mind the TV program, a, a, a 
about the angels. That's very nice. It's kind of nice that they have a program that's kind of positive about angels. This is rock-solid doctrine. This is not just a story. This is absolute. We have a guardian angel, every one of us. Now, I, be I believe some of our guardian angels have to work harder than others. <laughs> My <laughs> mine will probably receive several medals before it's over. <laughs> Others might not have such a hard time, you know. Uh, but we've got one. Thank God uh, we've got uh, an angel, a pure spiritual essence. You know, they, they behold the face of God constantly. Uh, they're powerful. Don't mess with your angel. What do I mean by that? Well, from your earliest years, your angel transmits messages to you. Uh, don't do that. Do that. Messengers. The angels are involved in that. You know, good inspirations like that. You know, like you, you may, uh, out of nowhere, have this good inspiration. You may see a poor person. You may see someone in trouble. And you'll have this inspiration to help them. Uh, undoubtedly, it came through the ministry of your guardian angel or another angel. Uh, there are all kinds of stories about the angels, and, and I believe true, many of them. Um, I remember one um, blessed uh, Jose Maria Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei. <clears throat> During the uh, Spanish Revolution, when priests were very much in danger, uh, where they were being killed, he was walking up the steps of the cathedral, I forgot, maybe in Madrid, and uh, a man approached him rapidly, and he seemed to have a gun. And all of a sudden, at the last moment, a very large, powerful-looking man stepped between Jose Maria and the assailant and frightened him away. And then he came up to Jose Maria, and he whispered in his ear, Mangy donkey. Mangy donkey. And he knew immediately that it had to be his guardian angel because no one knew about that term. You see, he always referred to himself as a mangy donkey in his prayers. And no one knew about that, not a soul. So he feels that his guardian angel had intervened to protect him from the assailant. I can't tell you how many times my guardian angel protected me throughout the course of my life. Uh, and, and I had a pretty wild life. Um, it's a pretty dangerous thing to roll a car at 150 miles an hour, if you'd agree. I did once <laughs> in the glorious state of California on my way to Nevada. Going about 150, flipped it. Crawled out through a window, didn't have a scratch on me, not a scratch. Looked at the car and couldn't believe it. The highway patrol put it up for a demonstration. <laughs> they, they, they put it up as, as an exhibit around Barstow, California. That's where it happened, out in the desert, you know, where you can go real fast if you're real stupid. <laughs> Not a scratch. I've been shot at. You name it. Guardian angel. Always there. Always there. And you've got one, too. Powerful. Remember the movie Star Wars? Remember the, uh, the little robots, you know, R2-D2 and, uh, C what is it, 3-CPO, whatever? Yeah. When, that, when I saw them, you know how they helped out, you know, the, the Jedi Knights, they helped fly the spaceship and everything? I, I couldn't help but think, man, that's the angels. <laughs> that's the angels. 
Uh, we don't have robots, man. We got angels, real angels, powerful. And God and Our Lady used the angels as messengers. At Fatima, they, they, the angel, remember uh, the angel of peace. He said, I am the angel of peace. And the angel of, of Portugal, when the angel first appeared, he said to the three children, fear not. Those words remind you of the words of Jesus. Um, fear is useless. I, and by the way, remember this. This will this come in handy as time goes on, what Jesus said. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. So the angel said, fear not, I am the angel of peace. Pray with me. Kneeling on the ground, he bowed profoundly until he touched the ground with his forehead and told the children to repeat three times. My God, I believe, I hope, I adore and I love thee. I ask pardon for those who do not believe, who do not adore, who do not hope, and who do not love thee. That's the message the angel conveyed to the little children. You see, and now, th and you know when th this was a long time ago, you know, almost a hundred years ago. And what did the angel say? Well, he, he gave them a prayer, and that prayer was to counteract something that was going on even back then in the world. I believe. Well, why did the angel instruct them to pray that way? I believe for the lack of faith in the world. And how much worse is it today? And we say, I believe. And much of the world says, I do not believe. And we say, I adore. And much of the world says, I refuse to adore. And we, we say, we hope. And the world is losing hope. Do you know what hope is? This is very important. I like to key in on this. Hope. Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire heaven and eternal life. Trusting in the promises of Christ and relying not on ourselves, but on the gift of the grace of the Holy Spirit. That's the church's definition of the theological virtue of hope. The key part, hope is a desire. People desire all kinds of things. And if you desire anything less than God, you'll be frustrated. Uh, St. Augustine said it best. Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in Thee. Our mind... Our intellect is meant for God, truth. And our mind can't rest until it rests in the truth. And our will, our heart, is made for God. It's, it's made for the good. It's made for love. And it can't rest until it rests in that goodness who is God himself. What is hope? Hope is the desire for heaven and eternal life. If you, absolutely speaking, spend all your time desiring something less than God, meaning something created, you're setting yourself up for frustration, sadness, disappointment. God alone suffices. Nothing less than God suffices. I didn't know that a good part of my life. You know, so I chased created things. We, we think that that'll make us happy, you know? And, and that's the message, message, that's the message the world gives us. Remember, you know what the devil, the demons are? They're also angels, you know, fallen angels. They're also messengers, but not the same message, a very different message. What do they tell you? Try it, you'll like it. Right? I mean, really, you know, if only you could have that much money. 
If only you could have that house. If only you could have that car, that job, that man, that woman. Then you'd be happy. Wrong. Wrong. And so we chase one created good after the next, engaged in a chronic, perpetual exercise in futility and frustration. And then we wonder why we have no peace, why we have no joy. Let me tell you, take it from somebody who's been there and done that. No amount of money is going to make you happy. Now, I know that a few more bucks might not hurt. <laughs> and I don't begrudge you that. Now, I know. We've got to have some money. That's just the way the world works. And that's okay. And it's okay to work for some money. Not a problem. Keep your priorities straight. Don't engage in idolatry. You know, you, you can erect all kind of created things as idols. Money is probably the, the number one idol that's been uh, erected in society today. And, and believe me, people fall down and worship it. They do. They say, oh, no, I wouldn't worship money. Then why you spend all your time chasing it? That's what happens, you know. Uh, sex, drugs. Rock and roll can be idols, you know. Uh, be careful. Be careful what you worship. You know, uh, people say, oh, I don't worship that. What do you spend all your time doing? You know, I often ask people, just to illustrate a point, how, how, how much time you watch television in a given day. And I'm not saying that watching television is evil. I'm not saying that. But, but just to make you think, uh, they say that the average person in the United States watches four or five hours of television a day. And so I just say, well, how many hours a day you devote to God? How many hours a day you pray? And then just compare it to how many hours you watch television. Just, just to give you an idea of where your priorities are. You know, and watch out for what you erect as an idol. And so the angels delivered this, this message, this prayer. You know, most of the world doesn't believe, doesn't hope, doesn't adore, and doesn't love God with their whole heart, mind, and strength. And so the angel was conveying this message, this prayer, and trying to get the children in their purity, in their innocence, to pray. Why? To offer reparation for the world which didn't feel that kind of faith and hope uh, and love. And the message isn't just for the little children at Fatima. It's for you and for me, you know? You've got to have faith. What's faith? The faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God Believe all that God has said and revealed to us. Believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief. Because he who has revealed it is truth itself. That's a theological virtue of faith. That's real faith. Yeah, we believe in God. doesn't just mean that we believe in the existence of God. You know, some people today think they're doing God a favor by believing in his existence. They do. Uh, you know, if I say, what is faith? Oh, I believe in God. What, what does that mean exactly? Well, you know, he's exist, he exists. Listen, Satan believes in the existence of God, and you know where he is. <laughs> Not enough. If you really believe in God, then you believe everything he's said. Everything is revealed to us. And you believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief. You know, it, it, you're not a cafeteria Catholic. You don't just pick and choose, accept what fits with your lifestyle, reject what you don't like. You can't do it. Comes as a package, an integrity. You've got to accept it all, or you run the risk of losing it all. Like St. Thomas Aquinas says, uh, the faith is a seamless garment. Uh, you can't 
uh, excise a piece of it here, tear a piece of it there. It just doesn't work that way. It's just like if you have a, uh, a, a ship on the ocean. Well, you, 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 you blast one hole in the hull of the ship, the whole ship goes to the bottom. Or you have a, a stone wall and you take a stone out at the foundation, the entire wall collapses. That's what happens with the faith. It's an integrity. Uh, once you start rejecting elements of faith or morals, you run the, you're down a slippery slope. And then it's one after the other. They fall by the wayside. The message in all this. Pray like this, the angel said to the children and says to us. Pray like this. Think like this. Live like this. My God, I believe. I believe for all the people who don't believe. I hope for all the people who no longer hope. God help us. I've seen some of the dark places in the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen some of the darkest places on the face of the earth. And when I say that, I mean, I saw a lot of dark places in the days when I lived in Los Angeles. In the days when I was dancing with the devil. In the days when I was addicted to cocaine. I've been in dark places. I've been in those moral caves and holes in the ground. And a miracle that I'm alive. Uh, all those people that have lost hope. Oh, I, I wake up in the middle of the night often sweating, frightened. And those people, I can see them. I can see them. Oh, I see them getting high in that crack house. I see them on their way to death. I fear for them. And I pray, I hope, I'll hope for them. They've lost hope, so many of them. My Lord, my God, I hope for all the ones who can no longer hope. And you've got to think that way. You've got to live that way. Pray that way. There's a message not just for the little children, the seers at Fatima, but for us. Today, now, here, message of life. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Pray like this, for the hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to your prayers, the angel told the children. And then the angel appeared to them again in midsummer and said, What are you doing? You know, he was kind of upbraiding them. They were not, they were spending a lot of their time like most children would do. Uh, not, not like their life depended on these prayers, not like somebody else's soul. Dependent on this. What are you doing, the angel said, the messenger from God said. What are you doing? Might be saying the same thing to us. What are you doing? Pray. Pray and pray some more. For the hearts of Jesus and Mary have merciful designs on you. Offer constantly to the Almighty prayers and sacrifices. Now, every book, every uh, sermon, every series of sermons like this series that I'm doing this weekend, it kind of has a punchline. You should be able to synthesize it, condense it, reduce it to its lowest common denominator. And, and, and the message of Fatima really is a message of prayer and penance. It can be reduced to this. You know, if you know all about what went on at Fatima, the miracle of the sun and all that, and it doesn't move you in some way to live the message, then you're wasting your time. All the energy that people expended thinking about, you know, the third, the third secret of Fatima, that's a waste of time unless it moves you to live the message of Fatima. Pray and do penance. Okay, that's the punchline. That's it. Right there. 
offer constantly to God your prayers and sacrifices. Now, that's always been true throughout the ages. Almost a hundred years ago, the angel, the messenger, revealed that to the children. Pray and do penance constantly. Now, you and I know, more or less, what's transpired in the world in this past hundred years or so. Do you think that message is more or less relevant today? Yeah, more. It's got to be. Look at the state of the world. You know, that it's, oh, yes, we can say, well, Russia's been converted. That's not the real message. That's not the real message. The real message has to do with the bottom line, and that's the salvation of souls. That's the bottom line. And, and what are we doing about it? Why did Jesus came? come? Jesus came to set the captives free, right? Jesus came to effect redemption. Jesus was born to die on a cross. We are born, and we will die. And what is the meaning of our life? Any different from the good Lord? Can't be. The servant can be no different than his master. And Jesus said, where I am, there my servant will be. There he is, lifted up on a cross. And what about you and me? Is there a cross in our destiny? You better believe it. Pray and do penance. Now, if you all go to sleep right now, or go home and don't come back tomorrow, if you remember that one thing and put it into practice, you will have gotten it. Pray and do penance constantly between now and the moment you die. And that will be the most powerful thing you can do for the church, for the United States, for the whole world. It's about souls. It's about the salvation of souls. Of everything you possibly can, the angel said, offer a sacrifice. To atone for the sins that offend God and to implore grace for the conversion of sinners. In this way, you will obtain peace for your country. Now, please listen to the. Every word is important. Listen to it. Now, the angel, the messenger, is speaking to the children. Of everything you possibly can, offer a sacrifice to atone for sins that offend God and to implore for the, the conversion of sinners. And in this way, you'll obtain peace for your country. In this way, you'll obtain peace for your country. And in no other way will you obtain peace for your country. Pray and do penance for the conversion of sinners. In this way, you will bring peace to your country. In no other way will you bring peace to your country. Above all, accept and humbly endure the sufferings the Lord sends you. The angel speaking to the children. The angel speaking to us. Above all, accept and humbly endure the sufferings the Lord sends you. They may be little sufferings. They may be minor inconveniences. Be humble and accept them. My grandmother, in the good old days, uh, had a very, uh, as many, uh, you've all experienced it probably growing up, my grandmother used to say when I would do something, have to do something I didn't like, like go to school, <laughs> which I did not like when I was young. She said, Johnny, offer it up. Remember that? Offer it up. And what she was doing is, is in those simple words, she was expressing what the angel's saying here. She was expressing a very 
basic element of our faith. Oh, offer it up. Grandma, I, I, don't, I don't like this food. Eat it and offer it up. Uh, but I don't want to, you know, uh, take out the garbage in three feet of snow. Offer it up. But I don't want to walk to school this morning in the snow, a mile, through a blizzard. I'm old school. <laughs> offer it up. Offer it up. That's what she'd say, offer it up. And what she would say, hey, a little penance won't hurt you, you know? A little sacrifice won't hurt you. Uh, it's going to happen anyway. You might as well make use of it. You know, you can complain and moan and groan about it, or you can unite it to Jesus on the cross, and it can be powerful. Bring down grace. That was a, that was a wise thing for Grandma to say to me. It was obviously wisdom that the angel imparted to the children, and nothing's changed. Now, this is a basic message. Fatima isn't rocket science. In case you, anybody hadn't figured that out yet, it's totally elemental faith. Pray and do penance. Now, if you're looking for something more profound than that, looking for something other, forget it. That's what it is. You know, people, as St. Teresa used to say, oh, they break their head, trying to come up with all kind of things, this and that and other things, because maybe that basic, simple little message doesn't suit them. Uh, maybe they don't want to bother themselves with praying and doing penance, so they're looking for some other little pious exercise they can do. Forget it. Pray and do penance. That's the only way. The angel said, of everything you possibly can offer sacrifice. Now, people have funny ideas about what penance is. Uh, we read a few lives of the saints, and we get a preconceived notion about penance. You know, I did that when I began. I, read, I systematically read 500 lives of the saints when I came back to the church after 20 years. Uh, I didn't never do nothing halfway. <laughs> 500 of them, folks. I read, every, I read it cover to cover. And, you know, I had some idea about what the saints did. But you've got to be careful about taking a lot of that literally. You've got to learn the principles and, and then apply that to your life as it is to be lived today. Uh, an example, okay? Now, you read a lot of the saints, they, they did these rigorous penances, like they wore hair shirts, right? You, you, the saint, he'd wear a hair shirt. Now, what's a hair shirt? Uh, we don't have that really today. But a hair shirt, that would be a, a shirt made out of horse hair, usually, very coarse hair. It's scratchy, you know? It's like wearing a coarse wool coat next to your skin, kind of itchy, scratchy, not comfortable. You, would, you certainly wouldn't do it on a July day in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, but they might do that for penance, right? They used to do those kind of things. Um, but, but I always tell people, you don't need to wear a hair shirt today. You don't need to. Why? Uh, because your hair shirt might be sitting next to you. Uh, you might be married to your hair shirt. <laughs> and so don't, don't be looking around for all kind of weird penances to do. You know, you don't have to look around for all kind of exotic penances to do. You know, sleeping on a bed of nails or something. Man, live in peace in your own house, how about? That can be an extreme form of penance for a lot of us, right? I mean, religious know this. Uh, nuns and monks, they got to live in a community. <clears throat> it is a blessing. It's a blessing from God. But any one of them, it, you know, it, it, they'll tell you, they say, don't think it's easy, day in and day out. And it's not. You know, to live with another human being, a group of human beings, day in and day out, and to be charitable under all circumstances, to be patient and so forth, that's not easy, but it's good. It requires the exercise of virtue. And so the angel said, of everything you possibly can, offer a sacrifice. Now, he's telling them, really, he's giving them a clue on how to do penance. It's one thing to tell somebody, uh, pray and do penance. But a lot of people don't know how to do penance, especially nowadays, you know. 
The church tells us, Pope Paul VI, uh, after the Second Vatican Council, uh, he wrote a document on penance in the church called penitimony. And one of the key phrases in there is the primary form of penance is to accept with joy and gratitude the trials and tribulations that your state in life bring to you. In other words, if you're married, uh, there are trials and tribulations that go along with being married. It's not easy, in other words. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe dad is a little rough around the edges. You know, maybe he doesn't go to church as much as you do. Maybe that, well, it's a challenge to live under those circumstances. So, well, hey, offer it up. I mean, do the best you can. If you can convert the old boy, good. You know, but it might take a long time. Might be on his deathbed or yours. But, you know, hang in there. Hang in there. That's a form of penance. I remember once when I, first, I, I came to San Francisco several years ago, I was invited to give the annual retreat to all the novices of the Missionaries of Charity in San Francisco. And uh, at the time, the novice mistress was uh, Sister Lysa, uh, who's now third counselor uh, to Sister Nirmala in, uh, in Calcutta. And um, Sister told me how Mother first came when they got that convent in uh, San Francisco. Um, it was kind of in bad shape, but they fixed it up and they cleaned it up, and Mother came finally. And uh, it was like inspection day. Now, a lot, you, you may not know it, you know, Mother Teresa, obviously a saint, um, but she was like an army general. A lot of people don't know a lot of things about Mother Teresa, and, uh, but she was tough, and uh, she came for inspection, see. And Sister Nirm or rather Sister Liza was taking Mother on a tour of the convent. And they got down in the basement um, where the bathrooms were. And it was like, they're like public restrooms, you know. And... Uh, they walked in, and it was sparkling clean. I mean, it, the floor, the tile was shining, and, and the, 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 store, the stalls to the toilets, you know, they were all open for inspection, right? And Mother went in there, and she just stopped, and she looked, and she just broke it out into the biggest grin, and she just sat there beaming in the bathroom. And the sister said, Mother, what on earth are you so delighted about sitting, standing there smiling. She said, look, look, sister, look how those toilets shine. Some sister loves Jesus very much. <laughs> she was dead serious. What did she mean by that? Of everything you possibly can, offer it as a sacrifice to God. Listen, everything has that potential. Everything. You know, you're, you're, you're cleaning the house, the baby's diapers, whatever. You know, you've got a job, uh, you know, at work that you don't particularly like. Offer it up. <laughs> of everything you possibly can, offer it as a sacrifice. Now that, cultivate that attitude. Cultivate that state of soul. That's powerful. That brings down grace, not only on you and your family, but the whole world. You see, one of the worst things that's happened, one, one of the greatest victories of the devil is to get us to stop doing penance, to, to get us to lose that spirit of sacrifice. Now, that spirit of sacrifice, by the way, uh, that Catholics had in general more years ago, like when my grandmother and my, when my mother was a child, uh, they had that spirit of sacrifice. That was ingrained in them. The priests and the nuns, they taught the people, offer it up. And what they meant was, look, if it's, if it's not pleasing, if it's unpleasant, if it's difficult, if it's painful, offer it up. You know, uh, whether it's your job or cancer, offer it up. Unite it to Jesus, crucified, and there's power in it. That's what the angel said to the children. And that's what he says to us. Of everything you possibly can, offer it as a sacrifice 
That's pleasing to God. You're united to Jesus and him crucified. That's, a, that's the, one of the, 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 my favorite line from my doctoral thesis, and I don't remember offhand most of it, of course, but one thing, and I know the Holy Spirit gave it to me, one line from it is, to be set on the cross in Christ is to be placed at the pinnacle of human possibilities. You think about that. To be elevated on the cross in Christ is to be set at the very pinnacle of human possibilities. Why? Because no greater love hath a man but that he lay down his life for his friends. Of everything you possibly can, offer it as a sacrifice to God. That's what the messenger said. O blessed Trinity, the angel said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore thee reverently and offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, to atone for the insults, profanities, and indifferences which offend him, and for the infinite merits of his sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, I implore the conversion of poor sinners. The Eucharist, again. Offer the Holy Eucharist to the Father. Offer Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity to the Father. That's the most pleasing sacrifice that there is. The sacrifice of the Son. The Paschal Mystery. The Passion, Death, Resurrection of the Lord. When we, when we go to Mass, when we receive Holy Communion, Think, remember what it is. I'll talk much more about it tomorrow in that last talk. This is not something trivial. The Holy Eucharist is not merely a sign of Jesus. It is Jesus. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Emmanuel, God among us. Jesus, true God and true man. That's the Eucharist. And God is continually outraged by the sacrileges that have been compounded with each advancing year. People in mortal sin, cavalierly, cavalierly walking up and receiving the Holy Eucharist, as though it were nothing. Politicians who call themselves Catholic and vote for an ungodly, heinous catastrophe and outrage called abortion, partial birth abortion. And then they receive the Holy Eucharist having been collaborators in the most outrageous sin imaginable? Unbelievable. Outrage. Atone. Offer reparation. Say the prayer. O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you reverently, and I offer you the most precious body blood soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. My dear friends, the Eucharist is the hope of the world, the only hope of the world. And when enough of us become serious about making the Holy Eucharist truly the center of our life, when we become more and more holy and reverent and well-disposed, so that we can offer reparation for those unbelievable sacrileges which are so common. An example, a proof, if you will. On Sundays, everybody goes to Holy Communion. Check out the confession line on Saturday. Very few people. Very few people. And so shall we believe that we no longer sin, 
we're all immaculately conceived. Or perhaps are a lot of people receiving the Blessed Eucharist with a soul that's less than clean. I think a lot of us have to go to confession more frequently. I know you do, but, but in the church in general, it's a big problem, a terribly big problem. The message is almost 100 years old. It is, is fresh and relevant as it happened yesterday. And so, listen. Listen to the messenger who spoke to the children, who said, eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, terribly outraged by the ingratitude of men, and then offer reparation for their sins, and console God. Now there is a thought that should console us. We can console God. We can console God. Pray, do penance, work with Jesus for the salvation of souls. The gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Well, as you know very well, uh, one of the significant elements of uh, the messages at Fatima uh, concerned the rosary and the brown scapula. Uh, in my own kind of simple way, um, I was in the Army when I was young, and um, I kind of explain it in terms of... Um, the rosary being your weapon, and the scapular being your dog tags. <laughs> you know, the dog tags, uh, they, they identify you, right? They have your name and serial number on there. Weapon, that's self-explanatory. Padre Pio would often say, great saint of our times, he would say, bring me my weapon. Bring me my, my weapon. And the brothers would say, what are you talking about? Your weapon. You're, you're Franciscan. You can't have a weapon. Bring me my rosary. <laughs> he knew. Great weapon. Powerful weapon in this cosmic warfare against evil. The rosary and the scapular are of enormous importance, and if they weren't, Our Lady wouldn't have bothered to convey that to us. It's very difficult for me to speak eloquently enough to convey to you how important the rosary and the scapular are. I've tried to do it in my life as a priest and a preacher, uh, by constantly referring, especially to the rosary. I have preached on the brown scapula, uh, but, all, but mostly on the rosary. I, I've done it nonstop since the day I began. Um, and I, God willing, I'll never stop until the day I die. Let me talk about uh, the brown scapula first. Uh, <laughs> an interesting thing, uh, you know, Sister Lucy... Uh, kind of summarized it when, when she said in one of the apparitions, Our Lady appeared, it, it seemed to me, dressed in the Carmelite habit. She had a rosary, the brown scapula, and that's where it, that's where it began. Now, let, let's, I'm going to talk about the brown scapula the way that I have done it. I'm not an expert. On it. I'll just do it in a simple way, uh, as I understand it. But the brown scapula, you know, comes from the Carmelite habit. Um, now, the Carmelite order is a very ancient one, really began with the hermits on Mount Carmel from the Old Testament, and then that evolved into the, the Carmelites and discalced Carmelites we have today. And Our Lady wanted us to 
be clothed in that brown scapula. But what does it mean? You know, uh, you've all heard that, uh, well, if you wear the brown scapula, um, you won't go to hell. Or Our Lady will rescue you from purgatory, right? Yes, but that's not the important part. Um, what, what does it really mean to be clothed with the brown scapula? Now, I remember I received a rosary and a brown scapula the day I made my first Holy Communion. In the good old days, that was a common practice. Uh, the children would get a rosary and a brown, and we were, would be uh, invested in the brown scapula, enrolled in the brown scapula. And um, that's, that was the case with me. I think I was eight years old. Um, when that happened. Now, it actually, long before that, um, when I was 10 days old, actually, uh, my mother brought me, well, she brought me home from the hospital. I guess I was seven days old. In those days, you know, they kept you longer. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I think I got home when I was six or seven days old. And my mother told me that she, she laid me down in the bassinet, they called it in those days, wasn't even a crib, and uh, she hung up, she immediately put a rosary and a brown scapular, hung it on the edge, and she told me that, she said to the Blessed Mother, all right, uh, I'm his mother here, but you're his real mother, so take over. <laughs> and um, my first uh, association with the brown scapular and the rosary was when I was about seven days old. Three days later, I was baptized. Uh, it's enormously important. Um, I, I can't help but think of it in terms of battle, and that's not just because of my own personal um, understanding of things, my own background. Uh, there's some precedent for it. You read the Bible, and in the first book of the Bible and in the last book of the Bible, uh, we've got the language of war um, in the Proto-Evangelium the third chapter of Genesis. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. And the battle was on. You know, the, the, Our Lady and the devil. Enemies from the beginning. The last book of the Bible, Revelation, chapter 12. The woman clothed with the sun with the moon at her feet and a crown of 12 stars about her head. And, and what happened? She did the red dragon, you know, images of war. Uh, your mama wears combat boots. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Our lady is a warrior. She protects her children. And this is war. If you don't think this is, let me tell you something. The war that I'm talking about will make the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and every other war, all wars, rolled into one, they pale into utter insignificance when compared to the war I'm talking about. I'm talking about this war for souls. I'm talking about this primordial combat between good and evil, light and darkness, truth and lies, life and death. And that war is moving quickly toward a culmination soon. I don't know when. The angels don't even know when. But we sense that it's not a million years from now. We sense that we're moving rapidly toward a victory. And it is a victory. Don't forget that. You know, sometimes we can be discouraged. My mother, I get discouraged, too. Um, sometimes I'll go home and I'll be discouraged. And often my mother, you know, mothers, no matter how old they get, my mom's 80. Uh, now, she was 80 in May. And, um, you know, I've, every passing year, I've been a priest for another year. And, uh, you know, but mom is always mom. <laughs> and uh, they, you don't outgrow mom. And uh, mom straightens me out to this day. And I'll get discouraged, and she'll pick up the Bible, and she'll say, we know the last chapter of the book. We win. <laughs> and that's the bottom line.
Oh, it's a battle. It's fierce. And sometimes it seems like we're losing. But in the end, we win. And there's just no getting around that. And so don't forget it. Don't forget it. Well, the brown scapular is a share in Carmelite spirituality. Let me, let me just, you know, everybody knows what it is. I've got one on. I always wear a brown scapular. I have for years. And, and you know what it is. You know you're enrolled in it. And so, but look, I'm going to talk about kind of what's behind it. Why did Our Lady want that devotion spread? Uh, why did she want uh, as many people as possible to wear the brown scapula? Carmelite spirituality, very important. Now, it is not a coincidence that three, uh, there are only 33 doctors of the church in the history of the church. Okay? Three of the most, oh, the, the, the ones that you'd recognize uh, the most are Carmelites. St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and St. Therese, Little Flower. Right? She was the last one. St. Therese, Little Flower, she's 33. She's, she's the last one that, that was elevated to that great dignity of being a doctor of the church. Now, what does that mean? Um, it, it means that that person had a purity of doctrine that they taught to the church that was much higher than normal. It, it was above reproach. Now, the Carmelite doctors have taught us about prayer. Now, some of the doctors of the church, like St. Francis de Sales, he was a moral theologian, and he gave us great, sublime teaching in moral theology. But the Carmelites gave, taught us about prayer. And remember, the, the real essence of the Fatima messages is pray and do penance. That's really what it is. Pray and do penance. Over and over, in many different ways, that's the message. Pray and do penance. Well, what, what's, what's Carmel about? It's about prayer. It's about prayer. And I, I think I'll, be, I'll tie this in as we go on with the other sermons in this series uh, when I talk about the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I'm going to talk about Carmel, uh, and you'll see how I, how I bring that in. It, it, it's really beautiful. It's really, really very beautiful. But the brown scapular, Carmelite spirituality, what it is, it's a mini version of the Carmelite scapula. You know what the scapula is in a religious habit. It's that, that part that, that goes over the, the front and the back, the long piece of cloth. Well, the brown scapula is, is the, the mini version of that scapula that Carmelites have in their habit. What does it really mean, though? Well, you know, when, a, um, uh, when we priests go someplace dressed like, like this in clerical garb, People look at us and they, they say, oh, priest, you know. Uh, it identifies us. When a policeman or a fireman wears a uniform form or a military person, right? Uh, if I see someone in a Marine uniform, you know, I recognize it. I know, hey, he's in the Marines or she's in the Marines. Uh, Air Force, same thing. It, it identifies you. All right. The brown scapular identifies you. It identifies you in a special way as a child of Our Lady, and it relates you to Carmel. Uh, you share in the spirituality of the Carmelites. Uh, you share in the spiritual benefits of the Carmelites. But, but what does it mean? You don't want it to be superficial. Uh, if a person wore the uniform uh, of the United States Army, but didn't really represent that well, if he, if he didn't have the character, uh, if he didn't have the courage, if he didn't have all those attributes that we come to associate with that, there, there'd be some superficial, phony about that. If you wear the brown scapular, and everybody should, live it. Now, what does that mean? That means to live that Carmelite spirituality, a spirituality of prayer. Now, what is prayer? 
Now, I could, I, in my catechism series, I, I talked the, the whole fourth section of the catechism of the Catholic Church is on prayer. And I could talk on and on and on about prayer. I don't have time, obviously, to say that much now. But what I have to say is we are called to be people of prayer. The, the uh, gospel says, Jesus says, you are to pray always. Pray always. And, and people say, oh, I can't pray all the time. I'm busy. It's like with the rosary, you know. Uh, I say to people, pray the rosary and do it every day. Oh, I'm busy. Are you busier than the Pope? <laughs> nope. I don't think so. He prays 20 decades every day. I'll guarantee you he does. And the popes before him did as well. They really did. And, and we should too. Our Lady wants it. Pray the rosary. Pray it every day. That's... They, the two go together. The brown scapular and the rosary are inseparable. Why? What do they represent? Prayer. Prayer. A life of prayer. Everything is a prayer, potentially. Just like uh, when the angel said, offer a sacrifice as much as you can. Everything is a potential sacrifice. At the break, someone asked me, does the sacrifice ha have to be displeasing? No. I, I remember one time I walked into the... Uh, into, the, uh, into a big room like this in San Francisco, downtown. And uh, I was talking, and a homeless man walked right up the center aisle. As I was, I was a little bit distracted. And, um, and I got to the point where I said, and, and you've got to offer it all to Jesus. Give it all to Jesus. And he thought I was about to take up the collection. <laughs> and he said, I don't have any money. <laughs> and I said, I don't want any money. <laughs> I don't have anything to offer. And I said, um, are you breathing? <laughs> yes. Can you speak? Yes. Can you walk? Yes. Offer... Every beat of your heart, every breath you take, every word you speak and every step you walk, offer it up. Offer it to the Lord. And so the answer to the question is, no, it doesn't have to be. We normally think of penance that way, certainly. Uh, it, it, it's something uncomfortable, something you, you uh, uh, a willful renunciation of illicit pleasure. You know, it might be food or something like that. But it can be anything. You are to pray always, Jesus said. And the people, how can I pray always? I mean, I'm, good, I'm telling you how. You make that intention. Everything you are and everything you do, past, present, and for all eternity, offer it to Jesus, and if you're real smart, through Mary. You and I know that. Offer everything to Jesus through Mary. And people say, oh, I don't have to go through Mary. I just go direct to Jesus. You can do that. You can go direct to the Father, you know. And um, I might be able to go direct to George W. if I want to talk to him. <laughs> but probably I better get an intermediary to introduce me who might have a, 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 a shorter way in, you know. Sometimes good to have an ambassador, a minister, intermediary. Uh, listen, God loves to see you coming. He does. He loves you. But I'll guarantee you he loves to see his mama coming even more. <laughs> and so uh, if you're real smart spiritually, yes, give it to Jesus. It all goes to Jesus. And this is authentic Marian spirituality. We, all of our prayers go through Jesus Christ. He's the one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. But we can do it through Mary. That's really, really smart, spiritually speaking. By the way, from when I started, that, that's what I did. 
you know, I, I have no, no merit on my part, but from the day I started, I didn't, I never heard of St. Louis de Montfort when I did this. But right after my reconversion to the faith, I had the inspiration, and I, and I did it. I made a consecration. I didn't even know what a consecration was. But I said, I give everything to you, Jesus, through Mary, your mother and mine. And in that, I know that God accepted that offering at that point. And I know that everything, and you don't have to be conscious every single second of the offerings you make. Uh, you can make what we call a virtual intention. You know, you can say, everything that I am, everything that I do, past, present, and for all eternity, I give to Jesus Christ through the hands of Mary Immaculate, our mother. And then you just set out living your spiritual life. Pray, do penance. How do you pray always? Well, just the way I just told you. Everything, you just offer it to the Lord. Every beat of my heart. Who does my heart beat for? You know how when people are in love, oh, my heart beats for you. <laughs> right. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, you know, my, what does it mean? Well, it means just what it says. Well, every beat of our heart can be for God. After all, we came from God, everything we have is from God, and we're going back to God. So it's only fitting that everything we are and everything we do should be offered to God. It's only fitting. It's only logical. And so that's how you pray always. Now, we should have formal prayer, okay? Formal prayer is like the rosary or the divine office, um, various novenas. You know, that's formal prayer where you have a, a form and you pray in that way. But there's informal prayer, you know, uh, uh, spontaneous prayer, talk to God. You know, talk to your father, talk to your mother, you know. That's one form of prayer. All kinds of prayer. You know, offer little things through the day, you know. They can be uncomfortable things. Uh, there are things I have to do. There are people I have to meet that are, it's not comfortable for me. Uh, very often, I will have to meet people in authority, uh, both church authority and secular authority. And it's rarely comfortable. Uh, and the, my, I can hear my grandma, offer it up. <laughs> offer it up, Johnny. <laughs> and I do. And I get through it. You know, you do the same thing. It sounds like nothing, but it's really something. It's powerful. Do it. So the brown scapula, that's a share in Carmelite spirituality. Where does prayer lead? Union with God. Uh, what's the whole point of prayer? What's the whole point of life? Union with God. It was said of St. Francis of Assisi, and he was a man of great prayer, but it was said that St. Francis was not so much a man who prayed, as a man who became a living prayer. And so the whole point of it is your prayer becomes more and more interior. Now there's liturgical prayer, we need that. And then there's your personal prayer. Uh, and all that prayer, it's oriented towards conforming you to Jesus Christ. Uh, the only way you get to the Father is through Jesus. And, and what does that mean? It means the Holy Spirit divine artist, gradually sculpts you. You're a lump of clay. You know, we're, we're just a lump of clay. And the Holy Spirit sculpts us gradually, if we let him, into who we are, the image of God. He sculpts us into Jesus. And the, the closer, the conformity to Jesus, that's called holiness. The more like Jesus you become, and that's a work of the Holy Spirit, making you like Jesus, that is holiness or sanctity. That's the meaning of human existence. That's the only reason we're on the face of the earth, is to be conformed to Jesus Christ. That's what makes us pleasing to the Father, and nothing else can make us pleasing to the Father. That's it, the meaning of life. The scapula, okay. Now the rosary. Boy, I have talked so much about the rosary in my 
13 years so far as a priest. It is so important. Why is the rosary such an important prayer? Well, our, it's a prayer of predilection of Our Lady, yes, true. But why is it really theologically? You know, basically, I mean, I am thankful um, for the great private revelation of Fatima, Lourdes, Knock, the other approved ones. I believe in these things. But I don't spend much time. This is the, I believe this is the first time I've ever formally preached on Fatima. Now, it's affected my life for years. I, I believe in it. I'm thankful for it. But I haven't spent much time preaching on that because I'm, I'm mainly a theologian who preaches. But I try to do it in a way that people can understand. Okay? Because if, if theologians talk in a way that nobody can understand, uh, then what good are they? No good. You know, I mean, they, oh, they, I shouldn't say that. They can write books and they can advance the cause of theology. But that's, you know, my way, the way that God's given me is to talk to the people in a down-to-earth kind of way that they can understand. The reason the rosary is such a powerful prayer is because it's the prayer of the gospel. That's the bottom line, see? That's the punchline of this part of this talk. The reason the rosary is powerful is because it is the prayer of the gospel. Now, I, I've often said how I torment some of my good Protestant friends, and I got a lot of them, and I love them, and I highly respect them. And uh, I've got some, a, a lot of pastor friends, and I even have some Southern Baptist pastor friends. And um, I, if I'm in a particularly uh, good mood, uh, I might say to them, well, Pastor, how you doing today? Well, I'm doing okay. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. You pray the rosary yet today? <laughs> so, what, you crazy? You know we don't do that. And we don't do that. I said, why not? I said, well, you know, we don't do that. That's not in our tradition. We don't do that. I said, well, what you got against the gospel? <laughs> no, you don't want to say that to a good Baptist because they love the gospel. And they live the gospel. They're, they're wonderful people. And so I'll say that, though. What you got against the gospel? What are you talking about? And then I explained it to him. The rosary is kind of like us. It's got two essential parts, a body and a soul. The soul of the rosary is the meditation on the 20 mysteries. That's the soul. Of the, now, what is the soul? The soul is the life-giving principle, the animating force of the body. So we say in... Metaphysics, the soul is the form of the body. Uh, the rosary has a life-giving principle, the meditation on the 20 mysteries. And um, they'll say, what's that? I go, well, let's go through. Um, the Annunciation. Where is that found? You know, I mean, the Pope dreamed that up? No, that's in the Gospel, Right? That's in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Well, uh, what about that second one? The Visitation, <clears throat> Gospel of Luke. The Nativity, the Presentation in the Temple, the Finding in the Temple, the Agony in the Garden. Scourging it to pillar, crowning with thorns, carrying the cross, crucifixion, resurrection. Then you go into the luminous mysteries, you know, the baptism of our Lord and so forth. Where do they come from? The gospel. We meditate on events from the gospel. Yeah, but what about them prayers you say over and over again? Our Father. Where'd that come from? The Lord's Prayer. Where'd the Our Father come from? The gospel. Lord, teach us how to pray. When you pray, you are to say, Our Father, who art in heaven. Where'd the Our Father come from? Came from the gospel. Yeah, but what about that Hail Mary? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Where'd the Hail Mary come from? The gospel, the gospel. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Who, who said that? The angel, the messenger, that was the message. Hail, full of grace. And then, blessed are you among women. Where'd that come from? That came from the gospel. So you've got the soul of the rosary, the meditation on the 20 mysteries. And then, and then you got the body of the rosary. 
The prayers, Our Father, Hail Mary, where'd that all come from, the gospel? Now, what is the gospel? The word means good news. Now, what is the good news? Is the good news something? Nope. The good news is somebody, and his name is Jesus Christ. So when you pray the rosary, what are you praying? You're praying the gospel. When you pray the gospel, what are you praying? You're praying Jesus Christ. You become who you are, the body of Christ, empowered to do the works of Christ. Now, that's the rosary. That's why it's powerful. That's the rosary. That's why we pray the rosary. That is a biblical and theological simple explanation of why the rosary is so powerful and why Our Lady wants us to pray it. What's our mother asking us to do? She's asking us to meditate on the gospel. The sum and substance of the gospel is Jesus Christ. When we meditate upon the events, the ministry of the life of Jesus, we begin to interiorize him. We become who we are, the body of Christ. Now, that's it in a nutshell. See, that's the rosary. We've got to pray the rosary. You know, throughout history, at critical junctures, at, at, at decisive points, the church has prayed the rosary. Uh, the rosary has stopped armies. The rosary has overturned the assaults of the devil. Now, you remember what happened? Now, it's not that long ago. I'm just going to help you to think back a little ways here in history. Um, not, too, not too far back, three years. September 11th, 2001. Every one of us remembers what we were doing, where we were, when we heard about it. I was in Los Angeles. I had just flown into Los Angeles the night of September 10th, and I was in a hotel room uh, not far from the airport. And my office manager called me early in the morning, turn on the TV, and I saw it, most of it live. That's where I was September 11th. And then after that, I went and I buried my father. His funeral was September 11th, 2001. So I, I remember real well where I was and what I was doing. And I'm sure you remember where you were and what, what you were doing, too. Immediately, I began to preach. Well, I preached my series called New War, Old War. Uh, I did that a couple days later. I, I had been preaching in Buffalo, New York. September 7th and 8th, I finished Friday night like I'm doing here. I finished, and um, uh, my office manager, Tamara, who's with me this weekend, she took me aside and said, I got to talk to you. And it was like midnight by the time we finished, and she said, your dad passed away. And so I, I finished the mission and then went home and buried dad, and a couple days later got on another plane and flew off to St. Louis to preach there. And then I preached that, that series, New War, Old War. And uh, a woman came up to me and said, I, I sure wish the president could have heard that talk you just gave. And the woman, another woman standing next to me said, I can arrange that. And we all looked at her and said, oh, yeah? She said, yeah. She, she said, I'm the uh, chairman of the Republican National committee in Florida, and I'll just hand it to Jeb personally when I get home, and he'll get it to his brother. And um, so it happened. So it happened. And um, not too long after that, the president in one of his talks said something, and it was a line right out of that, <laughs> right out of that talk. <laughs> said, immorality is un-American and a threat to national security. And right about that time, when I was given that for the first time, I told people what I've always told them, pray the rosary. You've got to pray the rosary. Every one of us has it. We're, we're in difficult times. Pray the rosary every day. And wouldn't you know, the Holy Father said it too. Right away. First thing he said. 
exhorted every one of the faithful, pray the rosary every day. And, and some people say, why? I just told you why. It's powerful. Pray the gospel. We read the gospel. Uh, we, we, we try to memorize the gospel. We live the gospel. Why not pray the gospel in order to help you live the gospel? It's powerful. And people say, well, I don't really like to pray the rosary. That, that's like me. I'm, I, can you imagine? I, when I was a kid, I was old school, you know, in the old days. I played ball, and I had one of the greatest football coaches, really, who, in, in, who ever lived, as far as I'm concerned. He, he was a great man, but he was a man of his times, mean and brutal. He was a tough, tough guy. And uh, I can just imagine telling the coach, when he's, okay, boys, run laps now. No, coach, I don't feel like running no laps tonight. <laughs> you have no idea what would have happened. <laughs> or my drill instructors in the Army, you know, yeah, Smokey the Bear, you, ever, you know, with the Smokey the Bear hats. Oh, drill instructor, I don't feel like um, running the obstacle course again today. I don't feel like putting that pack on and taking that rifle and going 30 miles through a swamp again. You don't feel like it? <laughs> and so you all tell me, I don't really like to pray the rosary. Man, the world's going to hell, and you don't like it. You don't like to pray the rosary. Why? Well, you know, I, I kind of get bored by it. I say those prayers over and over again. And I have trouble. Man, just do it. Like the Nike commercial says, just do it. Whether you like it or not, just do it. Why? It's good for what ails you. That's something else my grandmother used to say. It's just good for what ails you. Do it. You know, people say, oh, I pray my own way. I'll guarantee you, the people that say that ain't praying that much. <laughs> if you're praying 20 decades of the rosary every day, you're doing some praying. You know, you're going to be sitting there for 40 minutes, an hour, meditating on the mysteries, praying the prayers, being drawn into deeper prayer, contemplative prayer. Boy, it's going to help you. The rosary, it encompasses all the basic forms of prayer. Vocal prayer. Well... The Our Father, the Hail Mary, that's vocal prayer. Meditative prayer, meditation. Meditation on the mysteries, right? Contemplation. Well, that's not something you do. That's something that God draws you into. And so the vocal prayer and the meditative prayer will help to draw you in to contemplative prayer. What is contemplative prayer? Union with God. Contemplative prayer is union with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have a dim intimation, a taste of heaven on earth through contemplation. Contemplative prayer. Got to do it. it. It is the answer to all of the pained questioning of the human heart. The world is self-destructing. Wars springing up here, there, and everywhere. Um, there, there's this terrorism thing. You know, there's this, that new kind of war. I talked in my little series, New War, Old War, about, like the president said, new kind of war. Uh, it is a new kind of war. Uh, it, we never had anything like this before. I remember for years, I kind of marveled at how protected we were. And I, I remember... Um, thinking it's, it can't last forever. You know, we never since uh, the War of 1812, you know, uh, uh, no bomb landed uh, on these shores. Pearl Harbor was not the continental United States. Why different? In the middle of New York City then. And, and that's just the beginning. Uh, let me tell you something, and I'll, and I'll say more about this tomorrow. And I'm not saying it to be dramatic. I, I don't say things to scare people. I, I, I say things right straight from the heart because I believe them and because the Holy Spirit moves me to do that. If you think 9-11 was hell, 
I'm here to guarantee you that 9-11 was a walk in the park compared to what's coming if we don't straighten out in a hurry, if we don't correct the ills that this nation has fallen into, if, if we don't stop the sin, if the millions of abortions don't stop, the hourglass is about to run out of sand. It's got to stop. And the only way it's going to stop is if we listen to that basic message from Fatima, message of life for a dying world. Pray and do penance, 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 and then you will bring peace to your country and to the whole world. Listen, I, I support the president. I support our military. I don't like war. War is a horrible thing. You know, no, it, it's, only a crazy person wants war. They're, they're just, my grandmother lived through World War I and World War II in Korea, and uh, my grandfather was in World War I, and my father was in World War II, and I enlisted in the Army during the Vietnam conflict. There's always wars going on. And my grandmother used to say, war is hell, because she'd lived through some of them. Oh, she wasn't right in the middle of them, but her family members were in them in harm's way. War is hell, and wars are springing up, little wars here and little wars there, threatening to erupt into a large war. Immorality is un-American, and I'm talking about the principles of our country. Yeah, we, we've always had sin. I'm not saying we never had sin here, but immorality, meaning as a foundational thing, as a principle, as something we stand for. Immorality is un-American and a threat to national security. Uh, Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, and all the terrorists rolled into one aren't anywhere near the threat to national security as immorality. That's what will bring us down. Remember this. The moral demise of a nation always precedes the ultimate demise of a nation. Look at ancient Rome and Greece. History teaches us. The moral demise of a nation precedes the ultimate demise of a nation. Tens of millions of abortions, year after year after year, partial birth abortions, same-sex marriage, that we would have to have a serious discussion about such a thing. And we wonder why the world seems to be going up in flames. Listen, you've got to be sympathetic. You've got to be kind. You've got to be understanding. You've got to be soft-hearted. But if I love my brother, and I've got to, I can't confirm him in his sins and say, you're okay, I'm okay. Oh, God loves you right where you are, but he doesn't love your sins. Why? Because the sin eats you alive and separates you from God. And God doesn't want you separated from him. He wants you united to him because he loves you. If I don't say that, if I don't impart that message, I imperil my soul. You know, I've often said to people preaching, I've got a soul to save too, and I'm not going to lose it for any of you. I'm not going to hell for any one of you. And so I've got to tell you the truth. And this weekend, I'll be telling you the truth. And tomorrow, I'll be telling you the truth all day long until we come to the end. And in that last talk, I've been telling you a real big, intense, whole big dose of the truth. <laughs> and you all can take it, but there'll be a bunch of people who choke on it. And I'll guarantee you before it's over, 
congressmen and senators and presidents and bishops will have heard that message. And they might not like it. But like the old lady said to me one day, Father, I know your greatest gift. And I said, what's that, my dear? She said, it ain't preaching. And I said, oh? She said, no. She said, you can preach a little bit, but your greatest gift is that you don't give a fat rats <laughs> who likes it and who doesn't. And I said, amen, sister. <laughs>